Yeah. All right. Good evening. Welcome to, I guess this is our final Anne Arundel community lecture of the season. Um, it's good to have everybody here. Um, let's start off. We do have a couple of, oh yeah, something I always forget. My name is Chris Eberly. <laughs> I am uh, president of Anne Arundel Bird Club. Um, and I will introduce our speaker here in a minute, but let's get it. We have a couple of, couple of items uh, to pass along. So um, Hal and Lynn, why don't you start it off? All right. Yeah, yeah. we just wanted to um, plug, uh, since it's once every 17 years, you gotta have a t-shirt to commemorate the cicada emergence. And oh, it's hard to see, but there's the full T-shirt. Um, They're guaranteed to last for 17 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Till the next brood. <laughs> and uh, we've uh, added the link into the, um, the chat to go to the website. Um, they were created by Uni University of Maryland um, students to, and proceeds benefit the students there at the entomology department. And uh, it's really a fun gift, especially for, for small kids <laughs> who, uh, you know, hopefully are enjoying them uh, maybe more than their parents are. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and you, uh, you can just click, click on the link right in the chat and that should open a browser window if you're on a laptop. And if you haven't learned everything in the world yet about cicadas, there's uh, the Cicada Crew website um, that has tons of information out there about the cicadas. And I think they even put a plug in there for um, the Breeding Bird Atlas uh, side project, mm -hmm. which they want to try to document as many birds that are eating cicadas as possible. And Atlas coordinate. Maybe you were going to already say something about that, Chris. I don't nope. mean to steal your thunder, but no, uh, that's that's perfect. Okay, yeah. Gabriel Foley created a um, an online form uh, separate from the Atlas project. Um, it's almost more of an MOS project with um, Gene Scarpula, who uh, is going to want to publish the results of all the birds documented um, eating cicadas, and, and in fi fact. Um, Mike Raup, who's the cicada bug man um, at the University of Maryland, uh, sent me a, a, a photo and said, what's this bird? It's, uh, it's feeding cicadas like mad to its chicks. And it was a beautiful red-shouldered hawk photo. So uh, we'll be adding his uh, information to the, to the web form there. So anyway, all kinds of cool things to do with uh, cicadas right now. And then the next time won't be for another 17 years. So enjoy it while you got it. Thanks for that. Yeah, I, I clicked on that and opened the, the store. Uh, there are many options to choose from. Um, it's rather amazing and different designs too. You have the one with the wings open and there's uh, some that just show Looks like one of those uh, Hayao Miyazaki movie things with the red-eyed <laughs> monster. The nymphs. <laughs> the nymphs, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Pete, what you have uh, some news about the uh, Chimney Swift Tower. Yeah. Um, probably most of you already know about it, but we've, uh, for the past year and a half, with Chris's encouragement, we've been working with... Uh, the volunteers in the woodshop at Kinder Farm Park to My build computer, but it's nesting towers for chimney swifts. <laughs> and the first one has gotten completed in Kinder Farm Park in March. And we're now planning to have a dedication ceremony for it. We're gonna be dedicating it to Judy Brennan, who was our recording secretary for the past six years. Um, we've just set the date as um, Monday, June 28th. And you'll be getting uh, an email about it and there'll be something in the, ne the next, uh, the uh, May Pandian platform. 
I do want to mention that um, uh, we'll, uh, we'd like to have some help with it. Uh, we'll, we'll probably have a, a table for water and drinks uh, and uh, it will be helpful to have people there to help with the directing parking. We'll have a, we have a pavilion reserved that um, will provide us shelter since it's going to be the end of June and no idea what's, uh, what the weather's going to be like, but probably warm. Um, and it's uh, in pretty much in view of the tower, although the tower is a few hundred yards away. So we may have to shuttle people to the tower to take a look at the signs, which I think you'll all be interested in seeing. Um, so um, I would appreciate if people would let me know we uh, would like to attend and uh, if you could help out with the proceedings. Thanks. Great. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, and there's a picture. The newsletter should come out early next week. And there's a, a nice picture uh, in there um, with the information about this. And we will try to get that on our web page on the MOS website. Uh, as well under the events uh, section. So yeah, it's, I, I can't wait to see it. I, ha I have not yet seen it. Um, yeah, this has been a long time in the making and uh, it's always fun when things like this come to fruition. Uh, let's just hope the chimney swifts feel the same way. And let's hope we don't end our mini drought on that day <laughs> in June. Uh, I do want to just throw in a plug that um, we will have five board positions uh, that need to be filled. Uh, the current board is, is sort of coming to an end of its term. And uh, I will be putting, that will be in the newsletter as well. Um, but the open positions as of now are president, Program Chair, Recording Secretary, Media Coordinator, and Hospitality Chair. Now that may change. Uh, some people currently on the board want to switch around, uh, but um, give it some thought, or if you know somebody who, who might be good at helping out and contributing to the Bird Club in this way, uh, please get in contact with me or any of the board members and uh, we can we can get the name on the list. We will be doing the election uh, virtually this year and uh, we'll send a notice out for that. And uh, we'll, we haven't figured out the exact details yet, but it'll be some kind of online uh, voting, maybe through uh, uh, Google uh, setup. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Does anybody have any other business matters for the Bird Club before I introduce our speaker? Okay, I'm not gonna wait very long, so that's good. All right, well, again, thanks everybody for being here. I'm really excited about this uh, talk tonight. Uh, Melissa Boyle Lacuti is a naturalist with a passion for owls and is sometimes referred to as the owl lady when people can't remember her name. So if you ever come across her out there in the field, just call her the owl lady if you can't remember Melissa. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Biology from St. Mary's College in Maryland and a Master of Science in Environmental Biology from Hood College. Her research with owls began in college when she conducted an owl pellet diet analysis project in her ornithology class which led to her undergraduate degree capstone project researching the barn owl population in St. Mary's County in the late 90s. After meeting Dave Brinker at an Audubon meeting, well, anybody meeting Dave Brinker, uh, their lives changed somehow or another, it seems. Uh, but after meeting Dave Brinker at an Audubon meeting, Melissa began her work with solid owls and completed her master's thesis, conducting a trend analysis on the population in Maryland. Since that time, Melissa has banded saw wet owls almost every fall. As a visiting scientist and volunteer with the Citizen Science Program, 
She currently oversees the Project Owlnet Solwhite Owl Banding Station at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Edgewater. When not studying owls, Melissa works as a park ranger for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources as the Chief of Interpretation for the Maryland Park Service. So you may run into her out in the field in that manner as well. Melissa, we are really happy to have you here tonight and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you. And I think this is the first time I've done it, the owl talk in the spring. This is usually super popular in the fall. So uh, I had to dust off, dust off the owl talk for, for May. So let me share my screen. All right, and you guys can see this, I hope. So, oh, let me hide this so you can, can see it. Uh, yeah, sorry, I needed to you. Yeah, we're all good. Okay. Yeah, I'm running on one screen tonight. So uh, if anything comes through the chat, feel free to interrupt. I don't mind. Uh, this can be pretty casual since it's a small group. So again, um, that was a great introduction. I don't really probably need to tell you too much more, but I have been called the butterfly lady or the owl lady, uh, depending on what creatures I'm um, studying at the time. I also tag monarch butterflies in the fall. That's uh, more of a hobby, although we're starting to do more of it as a community science or citizen science project in many of our parks. Um, but I did get my start uh, with barn owls in Southern Maryland, and then my master's project led me to the tiny little sawwet owls, and I have uh, been doing research not as part of my job, but um, I do have a degree in biology, as you heard, and a master's in environmental bi biology. So I'm a, considered a visiting scientist at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, or CERC. And uh, every fall, I get a lot less sleep um, in hopes of learning more about these tiny travelers, the Solwet owls. So uh, I, ha I have to start off by thanking uh, Dave Brinker and Steve Huey, um, who were my mentors for the Solwet Owl Project um, when I was in graduate school. And without them, I would get a lot more sleep every fall. But, you know, I just can't seem to do that. <laughs> so first off, um, I'll real quickly introduce you to Maryland's eight different owl species. Um, most of you probably can name all of these. But four of these owls are what we would call residents in Maryland. So they are here year round. And then the other four are uh, migrants or visitors to Maryland during certain parts of the year. So uh, I can take a guess. Actually, I don't need you guys to take a guess. So I know all of you probably know most of these. So we'll start uh, from the left and kind of go around like a sort of a circle. So. Uh, the top left is the barn owl, and that is one of our resident species. However, it is a species that is in decline uh, for maybe a couple of different reasons, but it's a, a species of concern in Maryland for sure now. So um, that's one that, you know, a lot of people don't get to see. And if you do, it's, it's, a, it's a definite thrill. Um, again, they're, they're the ones I got my start with studying in college. The barred owl is the next one to the right there. Um, I have to say, growing up, they're the ones I heard all the time when we were camping or even outside of my, my home where I grew up. So that's another one that's pretty close to my heart, but um, in the fall, not my favorite because we've had some issues with those um, predating solid owls, believe it or not, during our study. So there at the top with those big eyes is the sawwet owl, and that is a migratory species in Maryland. Um, and I'll talk more about that. The snowy owl, also a migratory species in Maryland. And then um, underneath is the long-eared owl, again, a migratory species here in Maryland. And then over to the left, peeking out of that hole is a screech owl, and they are residents and very very common here in Maryland. And lower center there is the great horned owl, which most people are very familiar with. And then the last one there is the short-eared owl, which is another one that is 
a migrant in some areas of Maryland, not throughout, but your best chance of seeing them is probably uh, Blackwater in my in my experience. So those are our eight owl species, four residents and four migrants or visitors. And I like to start with that um, because we're gonna talk all about the smallest owl in Maryland, which is the Solwet owl, and they are a visitor. So uh, just a little bit of background, a lot of folks ask, well, why, why does it get the name Solwet? And so the story that I had always heard and, and I had always told too was that, oh, the sound was that of wetting or sharpening a saw. But then doing a little more research, um, this seems to be more likely to me or a better explanation to me because it doesn't really sound anything like sharpening of a salt to me. Um, but it's a possible um, Anglo, um possible mispronunciation, basically, of the French word chouette. Um, and that's a, a, a word used in France and French Canada, which is where we, most of our salwets are coming from, is French Canada, French Canadian, um, to refer to any type of small owl. So that's most likely where, where the common name salwet came from, was that it was the French word. And you don't need to memorize this, this timeline at all. And I'm sorry, it's all text and no pretty pictures, but uh, just a, a little bit of a brief history about solwets to set us up for why we're studying them now. Uh, before the 1900s, they were not regarded as a migratory species at all. They were considered an irregular wanderer in search of food. And that in quotes is from the research. But then in 1907, 24 sawwets washed ashore on Lake Huron during a snowstorm. And that's when we started getting some research about migration and sawwets in 1911. And there were four records of a migration. Then 1966, this is, I think, one of the most interesting um, local records, is, is 55 years ago, um, Jan Reese at Kent Point netted 29 northern solwets, and that was the largest number captured at one time in Maryland. So please remember that. Then as we move through um, 1967, Muller and Berger had a correlation between weather and migration, which we know all about now. And then 1975, we start talking about distinct migration routes for these birds. And then into the 1980s, um, the audio lore was developed to increase capture rates and actually having some protocol. And in 1986, Dave Brinker came to Maryland and set up the first banding station out in Western Maryland at Finzel Swamp. And then in the 90s, Project Alnet uh, began, and that was a network of banding stations focusing on the Solwet Owl project. So I just talked about this, 1966 in Maryland Bird Life, um, and I know you can't read this and I apologize that you won't be able to read it, but the two things I want you to look at is number one, the date. This was 55 years ago next month. Um, and the title, An Unprecedented Concentration of Solwets. And this is by far the largest number of solwets captured at one time in Maryland. And this was at Kent Point in Queen Anne County, Maryland. So that's significant um, in why I chose my location for banding currently. So Project Alnet banding stations are spread throughout. Um, and this is actually a pretty old uh, slide. I, I know there's a lot more stations than are even pictured here. But one thing you'll notice is that there's not too many up in the, the boreal forest. And there's not too many people up in the boreal forest. That's mainly where the birds are nesting and there is very little known about them um, from breeding bird surveys because so many of them breed in areas where there aren't people and they're not accessible for these surveys. So that's one reason these migra migration um, studies came about is that uh, not too much was known about the birds during that, that um, nesting time, but more was known in their wintering habitats. So Project Alnet has three main goals, um, and these are to support the expansion of a network of migrant owl banding stations, 
And probably the next two are, are what I would consider most important, but advocate the use of standardized comparable netting protocols. And that's really important because otherwise you're comparing apples to oranges when you're trying to compare your data. And improving the communication um, and coordination among our migration research stations in North America and beyond. So one of the great things about Project Alnet, and again, it started in the late 90s, was the listserv. So I get almost no emails on the listserv until about August, September, when owl season is starting up in the north those that are further north of us. And then it gets really busy throughout October and November. And then it pretty much drops off again um, in December. And I don't hear much for the rest of the year until owl season comes back around. So it's, it's a pretty nice way to stay in touch with the other researchers. So banding stations here in Maryland. And again, this slide is a little bit outdated. Um, Turkey Point is no longer doing uh, saw wet banding, and there's some new stations on here. But you'll see, um, looking at this, we've got the coast covered, the eastern shore and the coastal areas, Assateague, Tuckahoe, which are both located in um, parks, Foreman's Branch, which is part of uh, Washington College's field station, and then uh, Cuttingham Swamp, or Finzel Swamp area, I think that station has actually moved slightly as well, and Lamb's Knoll out in the mountains. So you'll see we, we've got kind of the edge, oops, edges of the state covered, but in the center there, the coastal area right along the western shore of the bay didn't really have any uh, stations. That is until um, I asked Dave Brinker if I could be a sub permittee under him and start a station way down at Point Lookout. Um, I started as a ranger at Point Lookout in 2010, and we started a banding station in 2011 down there. Uh, I got married in 2015 and moved up here to Annapolis area, um, and that's when, after that, um, sorry, 2015, I was still a point lookout, but I got married, moved up in 2016, and then 2017 was when we started at Cirque. There is also a station now in Calvert County along the bay um, at Flag Pond. So we have two stations along the western shore of the bay. And so we are now collecting data, I would say, across more of the Maryland migration routes. So each site is very unique. Um, just their geographic locations make them unique, but also just in some of the traditions the places have. So uh, on the left-hand photo there, that is up at Lamb's Knoll. I was not there that night. That was a very busy night and every little bag hanging there on that clothesline has a saw wet owl in there waiting to be banded and measured and then released. So that was a super busy night. And then the Brinkers, and this is another kind of old photo that I found somewhere, um, was having Thanksgiving at the Assateague station. So typically my station finishes um, now a day or two before Thanksgiving, uh, but the Brinkers typically run their station through Thanksgiving, sometimes all the way to December 1st. So looking at some trends from our Maryland stations. So this was part of my, um, my graduate research and I compared Assateague, Lambs Null and Castleman because they had over 20 years worth of data for me to, to look at. And as a grad student, that also meant I had to enter 20 years worth of data. Um, and so I think that's why Dave um, Brinker wanted me to do my, my research project, to be honest, because he had tons of data it all needed to be entered so that you know that's the life of a grad student so this was what came out of it though and you'll see these peaks every approximately four years and those are kind of the, the what we call those big years and some people call them eruptions although it's not not a true eruption um, but it is based on um, prey that we see these cycles in the, the saw wet populations. Um, it's typically because there's a very heavy cone crop from the conifers, the trees, that causes lots of seeds. That means there's lots of food for small, um, small rodents, 
small mammals and what eats those small mammals, but owls. And then the female owls are able to have uh, lay more eggs and able to feed more of their young, more young survive. And then we catch a whole lot of uh, hatchier birds on those big years. So unfortunately I have not con continued doing any data analysis after tw 2008, um, after my project was finished, but the cycle continues. We do still see that four year cycle. So banding season in Maryland, this was another part of my uh, research, was to look at the, the dates of migration and if they were different as we went across the state. And we did find that they, they were. We had earlier um, average middle date of migration in the Western region and a little bit later in the um, Eastern shore side. So, so not, not unexpected, but something that we did find statistically significant. So why, why did we establish a Salwet Owl banding station at Cirque? Well, to be quite honest, it was because it was nearby, but there are lots of other good reasons. Number one, that Western shore habitat, um, Western shore migration route that had very few stations studying it. And because I had been down at Point Lookout, we knew birds were making it uh, down that far south. So likely they were traveling along the western shore of the bay. And Cirque was a nice middle kind of area along that route, or would be, at least in my, um, my prediction. Also being close, kind of right across the bay from that spot in 1966, uh, where all those solwets showed up on Ken Island at Ken Point. So it was a really good area of habitat. Cirque is just a very nice, large forested area. Um, and then the fact that we could run this program as a citizen science opportunity was something that really appealed to me. And uh, it was way too long of a commute for me to go to any of the other stations. The first year that I lived here in, um, in Anne Arundel County, I commuted over to Tuckahoe a couple times, um, and that was a really long drive after we closed down the station. So I was super happy. I don't know if you could see it there in that picture. The first saw wet at Cirque was on October 27th, 2017. Um, and we quite literally walked right by it. It was in the very bottom tier of the net, and I, I didn't even see it. One of the other volunteers said, is that an owl? And sure enough, our first owl had shown up. And even when you set up all your equipment, you set up your nets, you just, you never know if they're going to come. And this was, you know, this was proof that we were doing something right. But our first year at CERC 2017, um, I wouldn't say was a great year. We were open, um, we ran four nets and we ran sunset to midnight. So that's called a half night station. Um, and we, we had about four weeks, 21 nights open from October 24th to November 30th. And we had eight solwets total over that whole time period. Um, seven were what we called new owls. So they all got banded and one was a local recapture. So that was one that, uh, stuck around at Cirque for at least a day or so. Um, and they were six females, two undetermined six hatch years, one second year, one after second year. But one thing we did start during that time period was what we called citizen science selfies or sit -sci selfie. Um, and we would send those at whatever time of night it was to the citizen science um, volunteer coordinator to let her know what we were doing over there at Cirque. So 2017, we only caught eight. And I thought, wow, maybe maybe I didn't pick a really good spot. Maybe Cirque isn't a great spot. You know, it really had me questioning it. But then when I compared the number to some of our other nearby stations, we actually were doing pretty well. Um, Assateague only had three birds that whole season, and that was their lowest season in 27 years of, of collecting data. Uh, Flag Ponds also only had three that year. Um, Chester River, Tuckahoe had seven and six. Cape May, New Jersey only had 10 and they typically have very large numbers. So then when we put that into perspective, I started feeling a lot better about our station at Cirque. 
So uh, previously, 2006 had been Assateague's absolute lowest year, but then 2007 brought one of those big peak years. So what do you think happened in 2018? Did we have a peak? Well, 2018, to be quite honest, um, this was what it was. It was wet. That fall was super wet. I had to wear muck boots most of the season. But it was a big year for us. Um, we did add another net. So we had five nets or four and a half net areas. We were open 25 nights, um, which was a little bit more than the previous years. But we had 54 total owls with two foreign recaptures. And net number three had almost half of our captures that year. And net number three is nearest our lure. And that's not unusual whatsoever at all. So 2018 was most certainly what we would call an eruption year where we had lots of little owls. And I was not expecting this, not at all. We ran out of bags. Luckily I have in my, um, my owl banding kit, a bunch of paper lunch bags. Um, and I call them my just in case, you know, in case we run out of bags. Typically we use the little um, the little um, laundry bags to help transport the owls, but we ran out of those. So we had to use paper lunch bags. Um, and we ended up with 24 owls, including two foreign recoveries in one night. And 15 of those owls came on the last check. I was literally calling Cirque security, telling them we were going to be running a little late that night. Now, Again, I was pretty new at Cirque. They were just like, okay, you're doing your research, whatever. Just call us when you're done. They were fine with it. But I think I left at 2.30 that night or uh, that morning, to be honest, once we finished um, banding and, and processing all of those little owls. So the two foreign recaptures that year were pretty interesting. Um, one of them had been banded in New Jersey um, two years previously. It was a hatch year in 2016. And the other was actually a hatch year that we recaptured um, from Vermont. And so it was banded um, on the 13th of October and we caught it less than a month later on November 8th. So that was some really great data. And I do joke that these are the winning lottery tickets. When you have a bird that's already been banded, that's your winning lottery ticket because you're really starting to get some data coming in now. So then moving on to 2019, remember we had that great year over 50 little owls and 2019, we had a six pack with a extra owl. <laughs> we had six, only six solids and then a screech. Um, but the screech was a first for, for my station, for me actually as a bander too. That was um, the first time we captured um, something other than a solid in our nets. So uh, this is when we started taking face shots of the owls. I'd love for somebody who knows technology a little bit better than me um, to try to do something, but I don't know. They're each very unique. You'll see some of them um, just have different attitudes, different faces. Uh, this one on the right at the bottom was kind of small, kind of much smaller than the other ones there. Some are a darker brown color, but really neat um, as we're starting to, to learn more about the owls. So 2017, we had eight owls. 20 18, 54 owls, 2019, seven owls. And then here's 2020. Um, 2020 brought a lot of new challenges, as I'm sure you all are aware of. Um, first off, it was the first time I've ever done bird banding with a mask. Um, we were really concerned that we weren't going to be able to continue our study um, because we worked inside the building at Cirque, um, the the lab building there. And um, we were concerned that we weren't going to be able to do that. But because this is a, a long-term study, what, you know, we, we collect data every year for a certain time period, we were able to do our study. We were unable, unfortunately, to have volunteers or visitors as we had had in the past. 
But the good news was that the owls didn't know anything had happened. Uh, so we had a pretty good year. Um, we were expecting quite a few, to be honest, um, based on early season up in Maine. We were really expecting a lot of owls, but uh, we had 29 captures. Um, there were 26 individual birds and 25 of those were solwets. Uh, we had three that were local recaptures and uh, one actually stuck around Cirque for a full week. It was seven days later. And so that kind of indicates that there is good hunting habitat there for the Sawets when they um, are on their migration. And there's potential that they also winter there. Some of them may stick around there um, all winter. Um, I haven't done any research on that, but we didn't recapture it anymore after that week. So it may have just been waiting for a good front to move through so that the winds were more favorable. That was my, my prediction on what happened with that. The other two were recaptured on the same night, which we do not release the birds near the nets because I'm trying to give them a chance so that they don't get recaptured, but some of them are just so attracted to that lure, they come right back. So we had a foreign recovery last year. Again, that winning lottery ticket was super exciting. Um, it was originally banded as a hatch year in 2018 in Garrett County. Um, and the really neat thing was that as I was looking at the age of that bird, I said it was a TY or a third year. And then when we looked the band up and reported it to the bird banding laboratory, sure enough, it came back as that it was a hatch year in 2018. So 18, 19, 20 meant that it was a three-year-old bird. We also had another screech owl. Um, wander into our nets and it was a red phase once again and a hatch year screech owl. So really interesting um, data starting to be collected now that we've been at Cirque for several seasons. And again, the, that as I tried to, to say, the winning ticket there coming from uh, another Maryland station. So as a hatch year bird, that bird traveled down the mountains. As a third year bird, it was traveling down the bay. So these birds may not use the same migration route every year. So what kind of data do we collect? And I've talked a little bit about some of this um, in, in telling you about our each year, but we do collect weather data. Um, that's temperature, wind direction, cloud cover. We write down where the bird was captured, which net it was in which net deck it was in and the direction of travel, which way was it going and what time it was trapped and what time it was released. We are using what are called mist nets. Um, so it's a very fine net. We open them after sunset. Um, we don't wanna accidentally capture any songbirds. So we make sure to wait till after sunset till it's pretty dark. And then we set up the lure, which plays the saw wet sound and that's what attracts them to the net. Um, and they get tangled in the nets and we carefully remove them um, from the nets and then band them. So we do transport the owls in our little laundry bags. Um, these I have found are the really the best things. I do use those paper bags if I don't have any laundry bags. Um, this is usually the highlight of the night for whatever volunteers or visitors we might have. Um, this is Jennifer here. You'll see her again later. And banding. We are putting a um, U.S. Uh, bird banding laboratory band. And here's my string of bands that I have left for sawwets. These are a size four. Um, and they're specifically designed for sawwets. They're a short band and it's a butt end band, which typically raptors get um, a lock on band. But the saw wets are small enough that they, they handle the um, butt end band just fine. And that's the size four that all the saw wets use. And the numbers are getting smaller and smaller every year. Can't be my eyes. Um, those numbers are just getting tinier and tinier. So we do take some measurements um, and this is how I learned to take my measurements from my, my mentor, from Dave Brinker. Um, it was using the official Donald Duck juice can. Now probably any four ounce container would have done just fine. But when I was at Point Lookout, uh, one of the folks helping me set up 
my station um, looked at some of the pictures from when I was in grad school and um, when I was working with Steve Huey and this was the official can. So he went on eBay to make sure I had the right can. And he also made sure we had a US Postal Service scale. So we're not mailing these owls anywhere. They are flying on their own. So they're only in the can for just a few seconds, uh, long enough for us to get that, that measurement and get their bands on them. Uh, the, the mass or the weight measurement is super important because that is how we are able to, one of the measurements that helps us to determine whether they're male or female because um, owls, like many raptors, have sexual dimorphism. So that means the females are actually about a third larger than the males. So our females are typically 93 grams or greater, males are 78 grams or less. We capture a lot more females. Um, this one pictured is weighing in at 95 grams. We've had some over 100, I think 101, what might've been the biggest one we had um, this past year, but why do we capture more females? Um, we think that perhaps the lure is a male um, call and that that attracts more females. However, there's also some speculation that the males do not migrate as far as the females, that the males want to stay close to their home territory. So while they may be migratory, they may not be migrating this far south. So still lots of questions. The more we learn, the more questions there are about the saw wet owl. So we take quite a few more measurements, the bill measurements using a, a pair of calipers, um, the length of the bill, and then the tip color. It can be either black or horn, and horn is more like the color of your, your fingernail. We take wing measurements of the wing cord and the wing flat. Um, that wing cord measurement is used for us um, to also make sure it's uh, in on the chart for male and female, there's some overlap and that wing cord helps us to determine those that might fall in the, the middle. And of course there are some that are unknown. Now they know what they are, but we can't quite tell just by looking at them and taking measurements. Um, we also look at the color of their eye and it's done very, very scientifically with this paint color chart. And these are from Benjamin Moore. And one of my uh, volunteers, when I was setting up my station at Point Lookout, helped me um, pick up the cards. And she, she joked with the clerk about, I'm going to be painting my kitchen a bright sunny yellow color. Can you help me pick out some colors? And these are the four colors that all saw wet banders use to record eye color. Um, so far, there really hasn't been a correlation uh, between eye color and age or eye color and anything else, but it is just a second or two worth of time that it takes for us to collect that data. Uh, we take molt cards, which helps us to record the feather ages. And then that way, if a bird is recaptured, we're able to compare um, the age of the bird. And how we determine that age is using a black light. And luckily, um, black lights are now small and convenient and come in a flashlight form. And we just have to, to get into a dark room and show that flashlight and you'll be able to see the, um, the, the porphyrin, which is a, it's a chemical um, that glows under black light in their feathers. And new feathers have a lot of porphyrin and it glows really bright, that raspberry pink color. And older feathers, it's kind of, um, the porphyrin degrades over time, probably due to UV. And so the older feathers have less porphyrin and don't glow that bright color. So the age classifications that we typically look at are hatch year, second year, third year, but then you could also have an after hatch year, after second year, or after third year, if you're not, if you're a little bit unsure, if you're not sure. So the hatch year birds, all feathers are of the same generation. All those feathers just came in that spring and they're all gonna glow uniformly pink or raspberry under the black light. We don't see the juvenile plumage here in Maryland. Um, that's when they're you know, right out of the nest basically, or in their nest box. So second year birds, 
Um, these are probably the easiest ones. Well, maybe hatch years are the easiest, but these are the second easiest ones to identify because you see this distinct new and old feathers in your primaries and secondaries. So you can see the bright pink color are the new feathers. The old feathers are kind of the, the more purpley color. And you can even see it on the lower picture there where um, under regular light, you can sort of see the faded older feathers versus the darker new feathers. So this one, it's not really a trick question, but does anybody think they could age this bird? Now, this is not the black light. This is just looking at it under regular light. Does anybody want to take a take a guess? And if not, I will tell you that this one, I would age as an after second year um, or possibly a TY a third year, but you can see three different generations of feathers. And there's one feather right here that's really ratty. It's actually missing a chunk right there. Um, and this one as well is pretty old and ratty. So those would be very old feathers. And then you have some new feathers and then some old feathers as well. So when you can see three generations of feathers, you can call it an after second year um, or possibly a TY, a third year. So something that more recently has come up, and I'm sure you guys have heard about this from others, um, is window and building strikes. I, I really had not heard of saw wet owls um, having this problem uh, as much as other migrants, but now we're doing a lot more surveys of tall buildings and um, people were you know, out and about. These pictures were from 2019 from the fall, um, but the Wild Bird Fund, which I believe is up in New York City, had um, a saw wet owl come in as a um, window strike and also Owl Moon Raptor Center here in Maryland. So um, it, it's a, a, a problem our migrants are facing due to light pollution and due to um, these tall buildings with a lot of glass on them. So uh, something to keep in mind during migration season and how you can help. So one of, I think, the best parts of doing this as a program at CERC um, is that we have the citizen science component and we have visitors and volunteers that are able to come out um, pre-COVID times, of course, and help us with the project. So we have had homeschool families, uh, a retired oceanographer, uh, lots of bird nerds, and even the West Road Riverkeeper came out one night and he gave me a little bit of a hard time saying, why have I never seen these? I've seen everything on this river. Um, and that night, as you can see in my hand there, we were able to show him a, a saw wet. And we also had a local AP biology teacher who um, my stepdaughters had as their teacher when they were at South River High School. And they um, they said they were not very good at science. Now they're graduated and have moved on, but um, I make them do science now as their stepmom. But sometimes there's an owl and sometimes there's not. So we do take our citizen science selfies. And if there's not a real owl, um, we have found all sorts of other things to take pictures with at CERC. You just never know. And remember Jennifer, who you might have seen earlier in my presentation, um, her mom told me that was her best birthday ever. She came out for banding, uh, I think it was a few days before her birthday um, that year and requested a saw wet owl on her birthday cake. And that's, I think, one of the prettiest birthday cakes I have ever seen. And we are inspiring future scientists. This was one of my coworkers who um, brought her daughter out for saw wet banding. And her daughter earned, I think, a couple hours of student service learning hours for this and had to write a paragraph in order to get those hours. She wrote pages. So uh, her mom was impressed. She said she is not a writer. She typically will only write that, you know, couple sentence paragraphs, um, but she wrote pages. And then my coworker sent me this picture. She did one of those paint your own pottery classes. And she said, 
I had to do an owl after seeing that tiny little sawwet. So this is um, her her rendition of the sawwet owl on that that little plate there. Um, so the future of migration, and you probably have heard a little bit about MODIS um, from others. So the future of migration is with technology. So the MODIS wildlife tracking system um, uses nano tags and towers in order to follow uh, the, the migration of many creatures, but birds and butterflies mainly. So MODIS has been used on saw wet owls. Uh, there was a very small sample done out of Pennsylvania a few years ago. Um, but my hope is that in the future, we will learn more about saw wets using the MODIS technology. And I think that's everything I have for you tonight. So um, I know that was pretty fast. But if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Melissa? Oh. Where do they, can you hear me? <laughs> yep. Where do they typically, what's the southernmost uh, range for where they winter? Good question. Um, they have been found in Arkansas and Georgia. So um, they do go pretty far south, but mainly they're staying in the Appalachian, um, Appalachian Mountains. I noticed on, on some of your earlier slides when you were given the sex and the age of the birds, it looked like you had more hatchier birds than after hatchier birds. Is that is that kind of the general trend? We do get a lot more hatchier birds and the population um, changes are mainly due to those hatchier birds, we think, too. The, if it's been a year, you get those higher peak numbers. Um, if it's been a lighter year, you get less. Hmm. Am I still screen sharing or you did it go nope. away? It went away. OK, OK, very good. <laughs> I would like to mention, uh, you were talking about how far south they go. Uh, Cape Charles, in the southern tip of Delmarva, had over a thousand birds one fall about 15, 20 years ago during one of the, one of the peak years. So nice, yes. Occasionally they go at least that far south in huge numbers. Yes, yeah. Cape May also gets a, a large, a uh, large amount. So yeah, that was kind of when, when Dave Brinker started his stations, I think he originally, he, he came from Wisconsin. He had done a lot of his work out there. Um, and so he, he hit Western Maryland first as his site. And then the next was Assateague and then other places, you know, Cape May and Cape Charles and places like that. So it seemed like there was really that coastal, that coastal route right along, you know, the ocean um and then the mountains but now we're starting to get more data here along the the bay as well 20 years or so ago dave uh set me up to ban saw wets at sandy point and oh really we, we only did it for two years the first year we only got eight birds the second year we only got three and then i ran out of enthusiasm <laughs> but uh maybe if i'd hug in there we'd have had some some good years but uh yeah, we set up three or four nets and uh, ran it for at least two years and not big numbers. Yeah, and and that was kind of um, our thoughts too at, at Cirque that first year when we didn't have very many. Um, but then when we compared with everybody else, we're like, oh, it may not be so bad. So let's do it again. And then we had that big year of 50. So, um, so yeah, and there's just so much enthusiasm um, with with using it as an educational project there at Cirque too. So um, that's, I, I usually show this little MPT Outdoors Maryland uh, clip about saw wet owls. You guys may have seen it. it it's getting pretty old now, but kind of goes over the whole process. Uh, Cause there's definitely a lot of nights where we, we don't catch anything. Um, so and it is, it is a labor of love. Um, that's a totally a volunteer gig for me when I'm, I'm doing saw wet banding. It's not, not my regular day job. And about 20 years ago, we ran a station for 10 years at, uh, at Jug Bay under Dave Brinker and Danny Bystrake. And we saw the same cyclical behavior about every three or four years, you would have a fairly large number. 
and then you go back to your normal six, eight birds. And so for the same amount of effort, so you had to be, uh, had to be a pretty dedicated flock of people. But it was a lot of fun. We learned a lot about birds. We, we did it in conjunction with a, a fall migration songbird study as well. So it made for a long day to do songbirds in the morning and saw wets at night. Yes, Can yes. You say a I word do or two about the distribution of effort among stations about being all night versus half night. Yeah, it, it does vary um, because Cirque is is a volunteer kind of gig. We run half a night. Uh, typically, I think the Calvert County station is running a half night station. Although sometimes on a weekend, they, they'll they pull an all nighter if the weather looks good and see if they catch more. Um, so it changes the effort a little bit. Assateague is a full night station as far as I know. Um, I think there's a grad student that they usually hire um, that has bird banding experience uh, to help through that. Um, out out in Western Maryland, the um, station is run by, in Garrett County by mostly college kids. So they do two shifts there. So it's a full night station. Uh, and then Lambs Knoll actually didn't open last year because of, uh, because of COVID. He didn't have, he didn't feel comfortable opening. Um, so I'm not quite sure. Usually I think he is a full night when he can. He has kind of a one man, one man show there, which is tough tough to do uh but yeah you can you can kind of work out the the data you know based on your hours so we we look at the net area the net hours things like that so you do get a percentage when you know so if i just say we caught 52 owls without putting that into um perspective with that the half night station for nets that kind of thing um so depending on, that was one part of my, my graduate research was normalizing all the data so that you could compare it statistically. Uh, so it takes a little bit of math, but you can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Has anyone ever looked at the, like, the capture rate or you know, versus effort or just overall for the first, I guess, to midnight, which would be a half night and then midnight on like each of those halves of the night yeah and it and it's interesting because um you do get um differences based on your location too is what one of the things i think we were starting to see i know lambs null says that they're on the top of like a, a ridge and they get a lot of birds usually it's like 3 4 a.m kind of like the birds drop I don't want to say drop out, but because they're not physically dropping out of the sky, but they're looking for somewhere to roost after like a long night of migration. Um, we actually have caught some on our first check at, at Cirque. So that to me means they probably came in the night before and were hanging out there all day resting. And then we caught them as they were getting ready to head out. So a lot of it depends on um, the wind direction uh, as well. I know at Point Lookout that made a huge difference um, because being down there, you're you're surrounded by water on three sides. And if the winds are not favorable, um, the migrants don't don't move. They don't leave. So uh, definitely I saw down there um, the wind direction made a huge difference mm -hmm. in our captures. True at Cape May as well, I believe. Oh, I'm sure, yes. Yeah, and I, I forgot to mention, and I didn't bring it out, but um, this year you probably heard about the sawwet that was found in the Christmas tree up in New York City, um, and they even made a little bobblehead of it, and I did purchase one, but I forgot to bring it out for the talk tonight. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, sawwets are pretty popular little critters, and that was a you know five minutes of fame for the sawwets this, um, this year. Or last year. Birds don't live much longer than three years. Good question. Um, I I know we've looked this up, and Lloyd might remember. I think probably three to five years is their their typical average. I think it's just hard to um, look at the molt to tell more than three years. Now, if we have banding records, we're able to look at that. I I can't remember the bird banding laboratory 
I'd have to look that up for you, Peter. Um, the bird banding laboratory does have records of older birds. That's and I want to say nine. Yeah. Does that sound right? The, uh, the oldest one from banding records uh, was nine years. Nine years. Okay. Yeah. I think you're right on the three to five. Uh, they, they are not long live birds. Probably a lot of predation oh. in uh, of hatchier birds uh, in the breeding ground area too. I think we lost Melissa. She needs to come back on. Ah. Uh oh. Oh, she's there. Oh, there she she's is. There. Here. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> my internet. My internet lasted this long. I was just saying, Melissa, three mm -hmm. to five is probably accurate. Nine was the longevity. And probably a lot of predation of hatchier birds uh, by other owls and other raptors. Yeah. Yeah. I just looked it up on the, uh, well, I guess it's now Birds of the World, it used to be Birds of North America. Longevity record for Sawwets in the wild based on banding data is 10 years, four months. Oh, oh okay. And the reference to that is, is uh, Klinkovitz, who, who used to work at the banding station. Uh, longevity in captivity is 16 years. So yeah, living in the wild is apparently not good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Melissa? Yeah? Do you know when the next big peak is uh, predicted to be? So if we look at it, I would say 2018 was our last, what would you say, eruptive year. Mm -hmm. So Probably not this fall, but the, the fall after that, I would say 22 is, is my guess. Um, Dave had me all excited thinking that because Maine was catching so many early on um, that, that we were going to have a good year last year. And we did have a decent year. 26 was nothing, you know, and especially that we were running with usually only two people working um, that you know, at a time we were really worried about having a big night and not even having the hands to help, um, you know, do what we needed to do because of the COVID restrictions. So, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. I do, I do have to say there have been some years where that fall um, weather seems to come kind of later and later and you don't get those good pushes like the the cold air with the cold fronts that really push them south until after our banding season is over. I know um, talking to Andy Brown, he, he's often wondered whether or not we should be continuing into December now that perhaps our changing climate and some of our weather patterns, it would benefit us to, to lengthen our banding season. But uh, by the time, by the time November comes around, I, I'm, pretty done <laughs> by Thanksgiving. I'm pretty much done. Um, but there have been years where I haven't started until I really saw Pennsylvania catching now that we have the list serve and no more, you know, I don't have to sit out there on October 15th and 16th and 17th and 18th and 19th and 20th. Um, I can kind of follow the list serve and then, Oh, like the 20th, the 22nd. Okay. We really got to get started now. So we, the other thing is, Melissa, they pretty much fall off right around the time we finish. I mean, the last three or four days of our banding season usually are birdless or one bird or something like that. Right. And a lot, uh, this is, a, I guess, a, a hypothesis or a prediction, but that at, once the leaves have really fallen, um, they've moved on further south. That as, as you have the, the leaf fall, you know, once the, the leaves are gone, um, they've moved, moved further south. Right. But yeah, the peak is usually right around that kind of uh, peak what, what, color period. <laughs> you said they primarily are around conifers. Why, why, uh, why does the leaf? Uh, well, in their breeding habitat, they prefer the conifers, yes. But yeah, in their wintering habitats, I think the conifers still are a preference um, as well in terms of um, camouflage. They, they provide better habitat, but we've, we're in a mixed forest where we're 
we're netting. Um, there's some pines, but it's a lot of other uh, hardwoods as well. I'm wondering how much um, is known about the where the saw wets are in the summer and in the winter in Maryland, um, their populations and types of habitats they may be where they may be found. Yeah, so in the winter, they are are probably in, I would say, the western part of the state, although I know I have seen on um, Christmas counts, people find them, I think somebody had them in like Montgomery County in a arborvitae or something where you're like, really, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So wintering, you can find them in Maryland, uh, you know, I won't say all the time, but it's not uncommon. Uh, people have found them here, but in the summer, um, they're in their breeding territory, which is in Canada, mostly in the boreal forests. Um, I believe there were some records in maybe West Virginia for breeding, but I don't know of any Maryland breeding records any any time recently. I think there are some uh, Western Maryland breeding records out in the um, like the boggy areas out in Western Maryland. Um, the oh, okay. The locations of those places are kind of kept kind of quiet because. Um, birders don't want to love them to death, you know, when, and have everybody out there with their tape recorders trying to, to tape them. And it's pretty disturbing on the, on the breeding grounds. Um, yeah, probably best. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, a few handful of records uh, breeding out in Western Maryland. Okay. And are they nest boxes or natural cavities? Do you know? Were oh. they both? Okay. Uh, Okay. There's also an Great. interesting uh, series of, I guess it's a long series of breeding records in New Jersey in the Pine Barrens, which is oh, neat. as co coastal plain as it can get. There's not a, yeah. not a hill taller than two feet over there. And they've okay. been there for, for many, many years. I don't know the, the population size, but. And also, I wanted to mention for for years I've done. Sorry, she tells me I'm yelling. <laughs> He's um, screaming. For years I've done the uh, Assateague territory on the Ocean City Christmas count, and basically every year, uh, for for fifteen or twenty years, we get some saw wets from one to three or four. Okay. And one of my favorite stories is about four years ago. One day. Uh, Two days before the count, we went down uh, scouting and I went around to my 10 favorite thick spots that I know about and not a single one had either an owl on it or a pellet under it or any sign that they had been there. Oh. And two days later on the actual Christmas count, seven of the first eight trees I went to had a saw wet on them. And this is like, oh. de this is like December 27 and 29 or 26 and 28. So something mm. happened there in the week after Christmas that brought in a bunch of saw wets. Which... Right. And you said this was just a few years ago? Yeah, this was like four years ago, maybe. Yeah. So, so I, I, I saw I, seven of them myself, and I know a couple people got another one or two on the island. So. Yeah. So, I mean, it might be that that we're, you know, we're doing our banding and we get, you know, that big push, but there could always be, you know, stragglers on either side of that time period. Um, and yeah, as long as there's good food, they'll, they'll be there, right? As long as they can find food, water, shelter, habitat. Yeah. But in this case, there must have been some weather event that triggered a, a big movement because uh, mm -hmm. there was no sign. Sounds of like it. No sign of them uh, two days before, and then all of a sudden they were everywhere. So, yeah, the rewards of birding. Yeah, and I think last winter um, J.B. Churchill had uh, a saw wet uh, either in his backyard and near his new backyard here in Anne Arundel County, or near. Oh, it, anyway, so uh, um, yeah, they they can be found you know, almost anywhere statewide. You just have to. Uh, know yeah, how to look for them, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And they, they, I mean, they really are like fist size. They are, they are like this big with maybe a little, little ping pong ball head uh, yeah. on top. So, uh, 
they could very easily be mistaken as a pine cone if you didn't look closely. Um, right. Because they really are about that size. And um, they have the cutest little pellets, I will tell you that. I, I had one, um, this was when I was in grad school, but cast a pellet on my hand as I was getting ready to release it. And I have to say it was probably the coolest thing ever. Um, <laughs> bird nerd, right? But um, <laughs> tiniest little owl pellet. Um, pretty neat though. That speaks very well for you. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, that was my lucky day. I should have I should have bought a lottery ticket or something, huh? <laughs> so I know it's it's probably hard to predict the status of uh, visitation at Cirque at your station for this coming fall and winter. Um, but is there a procedure that people can? go through or someplace to look to see, you know, if, if you are allowing visitors, how can people sign up? Yeah, it's through the citizen science uh, program and it's um, at, Allison, CERC. at CERC. Yep. At the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And if you give me one second, I'll see if I can Google it real quick and put it up here for you. Um, but I'm yeah, I'm not sure. Allison K. Wood. I'm not sure what our restrictions may or may not be. We usually only have six, maybe eight people um, at a time just because we do work in kind of the back closet. I hate to, to call it that, but um, <laughs> because we need to uh, need to be able to, to use the black light and we don't want to have, uh, let's see, I'm trying to see if they even have it. Yep, they have Project Alnet listed still. Um, so we can't take large numbers of people even pre-COVID or post-COVID. It's, it's small numbers, uh, but I will put the link in the chat for you. Um, and usually we only have signups about two weeks before uh, we start because otherwise people sign up and forget and take up a spot and aren't able to make it and gets confusing. So, um, but there's the link in the chat. Uh, okay, great. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, nice picture of you there too. <laughs> What's a good email address to look to attack, contact you? Oh, I, I'll put my email address in here for you. I keep saying I need to start a owl email, uh, but until then I'll just give out my, my regular email address. <laughs> Any other questions for Melissa? All right, well, Melissa, thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. Sorry we didn't have you in the right season. That's okay. Um, but maybe we can promote this and have people watch it again this fall. Uh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, but this was, yeah, this was very informative. Um, and uh, I think we had a lot of good questions. Did you say you're uh, going to send a recording out? I will send a link to the recording um, probably tomorrow. It takes a while for it to process, and it'll be up on our on the Anne Arundel Bird Club's YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'll put that out there, and then we'll uh, I'll have Deb Wade send uh, a note out to all the members when that's posted with, with the link. So thanks again, Melissa. Um, good luck with hopefully, you know, a good owl season this fall and uh, with a little luck being able to have people to visit as well. Thanks All right. Lot, Melissa, great talk. Really appreciate it. Thanks for updating the, to the 2020. That was super. Is that why you keep coming up? Back, Lloyd, yeah. make sure I'm keeping things up to date. <laughs> mm -hmm.
Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming. He he knows all this, I'm sure. Um, mm. Yep. <laughs> thank you so much, like you're, you're welcome. Good. There'll be really a talk great. on Solomon really on June 10th. They'll send you a link to uh, Natural History, Natural something or other Society of Maryland. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Somebody sent me that link and I thought I was supposed to be giving the talk. I was like, oh no. my God. But it's not. It's uh yeah, um I, you remember I just, who was speaking? I don't think they um, said from Garrett County. Um from Garrett well, County, right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I signed uh, up I for that yesterday. Mm, oh, good, good. Yeah. I'll I'll send I'll send you the link anyway, in case it's another one. Okay. All right, everyone. Good night. Good birding. And uh, we'll see you hopefully in person soon. All righty. Thank you very much. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you, Chris. Bye. Nice talk. Good night. Good night. Hi, Bobby. Good night, Bobby. Good night, all. Good night, everyone. Alan Lynn. Good night.